Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start by talking about the inspiration behind our company uh, and then how that has led us into uh, a, a really exciting field of, of bringing sustainability to uh, remote or what we call islanded communities, whether you're uh, in the middle of Alaska and surrounded by vast expanses of land, or whether you're in an island surrounded by vast expanses of water, you're essentially island and you're cut off from the rest of the world. There's no infrastructure. Uh, so it's a, a, a situation that most people don't appreciate, uh, how many people in the world are actually living in these uh, types of situations. So the, is it Earth or is it ocean? 70% about and growing because of global warming of the world is covered in water. Uh, oceans, rivers, lakes. And this water, if you notice, is almost constantly in motion. Whether it's tidal currents or river currents, uh, it's, it's always moving. And for those of you who have ever been to a beach and been knocked over by a wave, or in a canoe trying to paddle upstream, you get an idea of the power that is in this water. In fact, water currents are 832 times more powerful than wind because of the greater mass. So one way to look at the world is it's this vast resource of energy that's waiting to be tapped. At the same time, if you look at where people live, which is where people use electricity, it's almost always very close to water, an ocean, a river, a lake. And that's for a good reason, because water provides great transportation. It provides water for irrigation. <clears throat> it, it really is uh, obviously a, a life-sustaining situation. So by, by necessity, people have founded towns, cities, villages near water. <clears throat> so the amazing thing is, if you look at it, <clears throat> most of the people and most of the electricity Roughly two-thirds of the electricity that's used in the world is used very close to this amazing reservoir of energy. And it has not yet been tapped. It's still there just waiting to be tapped. So somehow, if you could figure out how to take that energy in all of that moving water and use it to generate electricity, you would essentially be delivering it right to the door of the users who live right near the water. And it would revolutionize how electricity is generated and transmitted around the world. Because we wouldn't necessarily need big transmission lines going around. It would all be done on a local or regional basis. So that. That, in essence, was the idea, the inspiration behind uh, founding uh, Ocean Renewable Power Company 14 years ago. Uh, a group of us got together and thought, having spent our careers in the electricity business, and honestly, growing up in Illinois, I knew nothing about, about water, about oceans. Uh, if somehow you could pull this together, it would be, uh, it would be dramatic. It wouldn't be a transitional technology. It would be a transformational, transformational technology. So that's how we got started in this. And then as it turns out, the more we got into this, the very best of these energy resources, these water resources, uh, which are really, it's really defined by the velocity of the water. The, the, the more velocity, the more speed of the water, the more energy there is in it, that stands to reason. Uh, the very best of these resources just happen to be located in areas that are, uh, for the most part, 
remote or near remote. They've been in decline or never actually had a peak economically. Uh, they are areas that have been basically forgotten. It's the greatest underserved market uh, in the world, is that people that live in these, these communities. But they're sitting on these amazing energy resources in terms of either tidal or river currents. So as we really got into looking at how are we going to do this and where are we going to do this, it became pretty clear that the very best place to start is going to be in these areas like Eastport, Maine, or Igiaga, Alaska, which is a remote community 280 miles southwest of Anchorage, literally in the middle of nowhere, but on one of the most amazing rivers that you'll ever see. In fact, it's the best salmon fish in, in America. Or in places like Kuchwak which is in a region of Quebec known as Nunavik. Nicole knows where that is. Uh, it's the very northernmost part of uh, Canada, of uh, Quebec. It's bordered by the Ngava Bay on the east and uh, uh, Hudson Bay on the, on the west. And it's an area that's uh, absolutely huge. And they have several remote communities, Kujwak being the biggest of them. Uh, and they uh, have this amazing river, the Coxwack River, that uh, is a tidal river. So it's not tidal or it's not river, it's both. It's a river, but the tides come and go through the river and it's got tremendous uh, velocity. But th these are areas that typically, during the wintertime particularly, unemployment rates can reach 50% per capita income is a fraction of where it is, what it is anywhere else. As an example, in Eastport, Maine, if you look at per capita income there, it's less than half of what it is here in Cumberland County, and it's only a four-hour drive. So these are areas that uh, are facing severe issues in terms of sustainability. Uh, they exist only because there, are, there have been government subsidies and those subsidies increasingly are going away. And so there are uh, communities like this around the globe that are really seriously trying to figure out how they're going to exist in the future. And energy is a key part of that. So what are these communities like? First of all, they're mostly indigenous people. Uh, the area I just referred to in northern Canada, Nunavik, is the uh, part of the Inuit homeland. Uh, in Igiaga, Alaska, there's actually four native uh, tribes that inhabit uh, that, that, uh, that uh, community. As I mentioned, they're facing severe sustainability issues. There's no local or regional fuel sources. Uh, if you ever went to Kujwak, the first thing you notice when you get off the, the plane, uh, there's no trees. So there's not even wood to burn. They burn diesel fuel for heat. There's no power grids. There's no pipelines. There's really no infrastructure. There'll be fishing boats, uh, a front end loader, a few things like that. But there's really no infrastructure. Uh, and conventional power stations, like a big gas-fired plant or, God forbid, a coal plant, they're just too big. They're too expensive. They just don't work. It's just, it, and it would be too, way too expensive to bring the fuel there. So they're on diesel. They're, they're, they're fueled by diesel. And diesel is expensive. It almost doesn't matter what it costs at the refinery. Getting it from the refinery to these communities is very expensive. And in sometimes in the wintertime, in Igiaga, Alaska, for instance, they have to fly in the diesel fuel. So you can imagine how expensive that is. And it's also environmentally risky. These being uh, indigenous communities, they have a high regard, a high respect for the environment. They do a lot of subsistence fishing and hunting. And every year, there are fuel spills. Two, year, two years ago, there were few, three major diesel fuel spills in Nunavik, northern Quebec. And this is devastating for these people. So it's not just the emissions and the noise from diesel 
It's all the risk involved with transporting, handling, and storing fuel. So the, if, there is a, if there is a solution, it has to be based on locally available resources, which means renewable energy. And any power systems have to be easy to deploy, maintain, retrieve. Uh, they, you just aren't going to uh, have the ability to bring in cranes or large pieces of equipment. It would be prohibitively expensive. So for a lot of these northern communities, solar and wind really don't work. You can imagine in these areas in the northern latitudes in the wintertime, solar is not a very good option. You know, maybe for an hour or so a day, but even then it's, it's pretty marginal. And uh, wind is very problematic as well because wind turbines accumulate ice. They, they lose their efficiencies. A lot of times they break down. And in the middle of winter in northern Quebec, I guarantee you, you're not going to get somebody to go up there and fix it. They're going to wait to the summer. So the systems have to, they have to work and they have to uh, uh, be uh, uh, deployable and retrievable easily. And so that's kind of the underpinnings of what our solutions are, which I'll get into in a minute. And again, because these are communities that uh, are, they're, 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 a lot of them were originally communities, that, that some of them go back thousands of years, but they're based on hunting and fishing, they're near water. And so when you get into these northern latitudes, uh, you have tremendous tidal and river resources, and it's right at their doorstep. So let's, let's look at the worldwide view of this. Um, there are two billion people in the world that live in islanded or remote communities. Think about it, two billion people that are isolated from the rest of the world. 700 million of them rely exclusively on diesel generation. So that's roughly twice, a little more than twice the population of the United States that relies on very expensive, uh, essentially environmentally dangerous uh, source of electricity. And you can see kind of generally where they're, where they're located uh, in, uh, in most of the, uh, the, the uh, advanced uh, societies around there. They're, they tend to be in the north. In Africa, there's a lot of people there that have no electricity, South America as well. But it's a huge underserved market. And if you look at the polar view, uh, I have a great map in my office, actually I have a round conference table and I have a map that I got uh, from a, a group in, uh, in, in Canada looking at the world uh, straight down, looking at the North Pole and it's really interesting. People, it takes them a few minutes to figure out what, what they're looking at. But you wouldn't believe the number of communities that exist, not just uh, north of the Arctic Circle, but even, you know, a couple hundred miles south of there, near, near polar uh, communities uh, that are, uh, that fit this category of being remote, isolated, and uh, no access to uh, uh, reasonably priced electricity. Typically, in these communities, the price of electricity is five to 15 times what you pay. So imagine if your electricity bill you got and it was uh, six or eight times what you're paying now. It would be quite a shock. But it, it, it goes beyond that as well. If you want to buy groceries in these communities, in, uh, in Kujwak, when I was there a couple of years ago, I went into the grocery store, a little bitty head of iceberg lettuce was $8. So they're facing sustainability issues. What's what? The latitude of the ring you mark in. That's, that's actually what's defined as the Arctic. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a uh, boundary there. But. Yeah, I don't know what the parallel is. It's uh, probably 65 or 70, something like that. Uh, but there's, obviously, because these are remote communities, there's a lot of complicating factors. Um, one of the great things is you, you, you meet some real characters. Uh, you know, people with names like Jocko or Tarek or Tunu, 
which are shown here, by the way. These are people from uh, Igiagig. Um, so it's tough because the logistics are very tough. But because the resource is right there, uh, it, once you can get these things installed and get them running and get the local people trained, then it becomes a very sustainable uh, situation. But no two communities are the same. Uh, part of the reason there's such an underserved market, honestly, is because everyone is, every, every community is pretty unique. So you can't batch them all together and call them a particular label that, you know, these communities are this, because they're all pretty unique. So they all have to be approached uh, a little differently. Uh, you have to build the relationships. There's obviously, uh, over the years, have been a lot of uh, people that have uh, tried to sell them snake oil and it didn't work. Uh, so there's a little bit of that going on. Uh, but you have to do it one community at a time, and that takes, that takes work. And remote logistics uh, are, are tough. Uh, you know, if you're out there on a river and uh, you drop a bolt in the water, uh, you got to get on an airplane and fly two or three hours to get another one. And so uh, logistics are, are key. And uh, you, they're, they're, it's expensive if you don't plan accordingly. So the, the implementation can be costly if it's not well planned. And there's a lot of existing and governmental community relationships that are in place. I mentioned that uh, these communities have been subsidized. So um, uh, if you offer them a solution that will reduce the overall cost, that may not actually translate to the actual people. Because it may be the government that's paying the subsidy, and so you have to figure out all the politics of working not just with the local community, but with the regional or even federal government uh, to be able to capture the, the full value of your uh, proposition. So uh, you, you, you have to talk to a lot of uh, very different uh, people, from government to uh, uh, indigenous organizations to local community leaders. And, of course, these people have no money. Uh, they pay a lot of money every year for energy, but they don't have any money to buy anything. So part of the solution has to be being able to package this in a way uh, that, can, uh, that they can afford and that reduces their annual payments that they would otherwise make for energy. So that's where ORPC comes in. Uh, this, by the way, is our river unit in, uh, on the Kujak River in Igiag, Alaska. Uh, our mission is to improve people's lives and their environment through sustainable energy solutions. And we do that not just from a technology standpoint of generating electricity, but being able to bring technology to make their, their local, what, that, what are called microgrids, to make them smart so that they can incorporate not just our systems, but if, if they do do some amount of wind or solar, be able to uh, uh, make all of those uh, generating resources play nice together with the goal of shutting down the diesel unit. Because if you don't shut down the diesel unit, you're not saving them any money. So that's the trick. So it's a combination of generation technology with smart grid technology packaged with a, uh, a financing plan that allows that they don't have to put out a lot of money up front uh, that over time uh, you can get your return on investment. And it takes an amazing team to do these things. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of at this company, uh, I'm, I was one of the founders, uh, is the, the people that we've attracted are, are literally amazing. They're uh, incredibly talented, they're smart, they're dedicated. We now have 30 uh, people on the ORPC team. We're in three countries on two continents. Um, we have uh, wholly owned subsidiaries in, in Canada and Ireland, Dublin, Ireland, and uh, Montreal. Uh, we have uh, extended uh, team that, that really stretches uh, throughout North America and beyond. I mean, we have research partnerships with people like Penn State Applied Research Lab. 
University of Washington uh, in, uh, in the state of Washington. The uh, University of Maine has been a partner of ours for years. They do all of our uh, uh, marine uh, monitoring, so monitoring for uh, potential environmental uh, impacts. Now in, uh, in Canada with Laval University and, and uh, in uh, Ireland with uh, 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 University College Cork, uh, University of Belfast. Um, what's neat is, what's common with all the people we work with is they're excited about what we're trying to do. So, um, we realized 14 years ago that this, this was going to be a very long putt. You know, maybe a thousand foot putt, I don't know. Uh, and we're down to maybe a 20 foot putt now. But it's, it's, uh, it's the kind of environment where the only way you can actually get through it is you have to be a closely knit team that, uh, that has all the capabilities that are needed, but above that, they're, they're inspired by what we're doing. And when we go into the office every day, we're doing stuff that's never been done before. And there's no manuals. You can't go to the uh, internet and download the manual for this stuff. We're making it up as we're going, and we're documenting, and we're creating manuals. Uh, and that excites people, and technology is great, but people are way more powerful. Speaking about people, this is the crew. These are people from, uh, from Igiagig, Alaska, that, uh, that deployed the RIVGEN system there. So these are people. Uh, we have two. This is uh, Ryan Tyler, our senior mechanical engineer, and Monty Worthington, who's our project director, and in Alaska, the rest of them are all locals that we have trained uh, how to do this. So our value proposition, uh, and this shot I love, the, the kids were fascinated by it. By the way, one other characteristic of these remote communities that was a shocker to me is the birth rate. The birth rate in Kuzhwak, up in Nunavik, is almost three times the birth rate of the United States. It's about 3%. So these, these communities, and another amazing thing, is that 70% of the people that live in this area, Nunavik, 70% of them are 30 years old or younger. We could use some of that in Maine. Um, so not only are they facing, facing sustainability issues today, but what are these people going to do? And they don't want to leave. This is God's country to them. And if you ever visit one of these communities, you'll, you'll, you won't want to live there, but you can understand their love of the land and, and their heritage. So, um, so being able to create economic development is key. So that really gets to what our value proposition is. So what we provide them is locally produced and locally controlled electricity, renewable electricity, from local resources. Nothing's brought in, it's already there. And they control it, which in many cases, the history of these communities is they did not have any control over their energy. It was, it was provided by somebody else and they were at their mercy. So this is a different paradigm for them. We provide a significant reduction to their uh, environmental risk, and that's not just in terms of the noise from diesel or the emissions from diesel, but as I mentioned, reducing the risk of fuel spills. And it creates local sustainable economic development because what we do is we train the people how to operate and maintain these systems themselves, so they have to, uh, uh, it puts people to work and they're working locally, we buy locally to the maximum extent possible. So it does create economic development. And uh, it's not you know, thousands of jobs in a community like this, but uh, we found in Eastport, Maine, when we did our uh, title project there in uh, 2012 and 2013, you know, creating 10 or 15 jobs in Eastport, that's like you know, creating 1,000 jobs in Boston. So it's a big impact. And another great thing that we found out it turns out that our power systems have no known impacts on the environment. We have uh, monitored all of our uh, installations 
extensively. It's been done uh, by third parties, whether it's the University of Maine or the University of Washington or independent consultants. We have hours and hours of video and, and reams and reams of data. And through all of this, there's not been one known fish mortality. So, and, and by the way, this is, uh, th these, these, these projects are all monitored by all of, the, all of the agencies, federal and state agencies. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife, NOAA, National Marines Fisheries, Army Corps of Engineers, you name it, they're all involved, as well as in Maine, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, in Alaska, it's Alaska Fish and Game. We have to uh, put reports together and they have to sign off on them. And they have signed off that there are no known inverse, adverse impacts. So uh, that was, that's been very encouraging. Uh, I can't say that there'll never ever be a fish injury, who knows, but the one thing we do know is that uh, this is uh, environmentally not a risky proposition. Our project, uh, Nigiagi, I'm going to show you a video of it in a minute. Uh, while we were, uh, we deployed during the uh, peak of the salmon run, almost two million salmon uh, went by our device uh, and not one injury. So let me tell you about the technology a little bit. Um, all of our systems are uh, kind of the core technology is what we call our turbine generator unit. We uh, belovedly call it our TGU. So we developed this TGU, it's patented, and the neat thing about it is you can make it bigger to uh, use in tidal situations, you can make it smaller to use in rivers because there's just not the space in a river. So, uh, but it's, it's, it is truly unique that you can see the turbines, they kind of look like, like uh, paddle wheels that have been twisted. And in fact, if you looked at one of those foils on the turbines, it looks just like an airplane wing, and that's because it operates on the same principle. The moving water impacts the foil, gives it lift, it rotates, turns the generator, generates electricity, and then it comes to shore through a power uh, cable. So the interesting thing is, you look at this, there's only one moving part. It happens to be a big moving part. It's all the turbines, the shaft, and the generator moving, but there's no gears. So there's only one moving part, so that means lower maintenance costs. Um, the other interesting thing as you look at this, it's kind of very wide and not very tall. So immediately you can see where you could get this in some fairly shallow water. So versus other competitors that are in our industry, we're able to utilize sites uh, that are shallower than pretty much anybody else uh, in the industry. Um, and it also, uh, it, it, the, these turbines, believe it or not, it doesn't matter whether the water is going into it or we're coming back through it, they always rotate in the same direction. And it sounds counterintuitive, but they always rotate in the same direction. So it's ideal for tidal, because all you have to do is put it in the water, and it doesn't matter whether it's the ebb, ebb tide or the flood tide, it always rotates in the same direction. There's no mechanical repositioning needed. So we've developed two applications. One for Tidal, we call Tidegen, it's a, it's a registered trademark name. You can see it on the left, this is the latest version of it. It's essentially a TGU that has a buoyancy component on the top of it, and is held in place with a tension mooring line. And depending on the water flow, one of those devices can generate up to 600 uh, kilowatts. On the right is uh, the latest version of our RivGen power system for rivers, much smaller system, 35 to 50 kilowatts, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, about uh, less than a quarter of the size of the other one. Uh, it can, and all of these can be deployed as single devices or you can put several in an array and then connect them all underwater and, and bring the power to shore. In all of our systems, there's nothing visible. There's no, uh, there's no visual impacts, there's no view shed issues. So uh, when, when, we were, uh, when we were in the water uh, in, in Eastport in 2012 and 2013, people would call and say, hey, I want to come and see your project. And I said, well, that's, 
great, but you're just going to be looking out on a bay. You're not going to see anything. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a great feature uh, of our technology is there are no visual impacts. And we're utilizing land underwater that really isn't being utilized. So there's not an impact on land use as well. The technology is great, but you also have to be able to execute. And uh, I'm proud to say we've done 11 uh, very complex, first of a kind marine testing and demonstration projects uh, on, on tidal and river sites in Maine and Alaska. We have gone through all uh, the highly complex regulatory processes. In fact, uh, we've turned that into a competitive advantage in our uh, collaborative approach with the uh, agencies. We deal with the fishermen. Uh, now there's, there, there's a group of uh, individuals, uh, rugged individuals, they're, they're wonderful. The fishermen are. Uh, and we've, we've gotten through it. In fact, we were cited by uh, the Maine Ocean Energy Task Force as the model for uh, energy development on the coast. And a lot of you don't know this, but Maine made history in 2012. Uh, our project uh, that we did in Eastport, it was the first ocean energy project of any type. That includes offshore wind, wave, uh, thermal, what's called OTAC, any type of uh, electricity generated from the ocean. This was the first one uh, anywhere in the Americas to deliver power to a utility grid. So we sold the power to the New England ISO. And that was a historic event in 2012. And then our uh, Iggy Agig project uh, we completed in uh, 2015. That was a demonstration project. This is the remote community in Alaska. When we were online, we were providing about a third of their energy needs. Again, it was a collaboration with the Igigagi Village Council uh, and the Alaska Energy Authority. So that was a, a, a situation where you bring both government and community together for the greater good of the, uh, of the community. And uh, next summer, we will be putting our first commercial uh, unit in Igigagi. So with that, I hope I can, I want to show you a video. This was a, a great video done by the CBS affiliate in uh, Anchorage on this project. Uh, Susie uh, Kist, who is, uh, is she still here? No. Uh, provided, we provided them the video, but they did this great. It looks like an infomercial, but we had nothing to do with it. So. The power of ideas. Can they rescue rural Alaska from some of the highest energy costs in the nation? Well, Alaska is rich in renewable energy resources, but there are also lots of challenges to tackle. America is full of dreamers. We push new frontiers by choice. That's what makes us Americans. Well, the president enjoyed the hospitality of Alaskans. <laughs> He also acknowledged rural Alaska's energy challenges. So we're going to deploy more new clean energy projects on native lands. And that's going to reduce dependence on fossil fuels, promote new jobs, and new growth in your communities. The motto of Alaska is north to the future. At the International Glacier Conference, the Secretary of State gave a shout out to the Bristol Bay village of Igiagik for its innovation. Ikiagig just wrapped up a demonstration project which uses river currents to generate power. These are the kinds of creative solutions that will enable Arctic communities to endure and to thrive in the future without having to rely on dirtier and ultimately destructive sources of power. The project is a collaboration between Igiagig and the Ocean Renewable Power Company. They've dubbed it RivGen. The fast currents of the Quijack River are ideally suited for power generation and its clear waters also made it easier to monitor the fish, which is hard to do elsewhere. But the data collected so far shows that there seems to be no impact. Company believes this project also has applications for tidal power. There's some significant tidal opportunities. The one we're looking at very closely is the community of False Pass in the Aleutians. And uh, they have a, a wonderful resource there. So will the president's visit lead to more energy projects to help ease rural Alaska's hunger for affordable energy? Um, I know that I've been in conversations with key staff members from the White House in the last few days. Um, I, think, I think his trip here to Alaska really has brought a lot of high-powered attention 
to what the needs of the state are. Rural Alaskans pay some of the highest costs per kilowatt hour in the nation. The average cost for communities on the higher end of the spectrum is about 70 cents, four times what Anchorage pays at 16 cents per kilowatt hour. We believe that affordable energy is the underpinning of every sustainable community and every sustainable enterprise, and you can't do it with 48 and 58 cent power. In Igiagig, the cost per kilowatt hour is close to a dollar because the community is dependent on expensive diesel fuel to run its power plant. But there are hopes that tapping the river's energy will help change this. When RivGen is online, it provides about a third of the community's power needs. Rhonda McBride, KTVA 11 News. Anyway, so uh, thank you for uh, going through this with me. And I would love to answer any questions you may have. Yes, ma'am. Um, talk more about Eastport, what's happened since uh, in 2012, I think you said. Yeah. Uh, we, we were uh, most active there during 2012 and 2013 uh, in Copscook Bay. We continue to use uh, Copscook Bay as a uh, kind of a test center. So we have done other smaller projects there, not generating uh, uh, power to the grid, but other projects. We are planning a project now in uh, probably the second quarter of 2020. We'll be going back with uh, uh, a essentially a redesign of our original design. Both our project in, in uh, Eastport and in Igiagig were great. They worked. It absolutely proved that our systems work. But they had a couple of problems. They were too expensive. And we had some nagging little issues that you would expect with a, a first-of-a-kind project, things like bolt, bolted connections coming undone, things like that. So we have spent the last three and a half years going through a complete optimization of our design. And I'm happy to say we have uh, reduced the cost by more than 50%. And we've increased the, uh, the uh, performance by about 50%. So that new design, the first production unit of that new design, we plan to install in uh, Eastport in uh, 2020. And then the hope is that soon after that, we can eventually build up to a five megawatt uh, project in, uh, not in Copscook Bay, but on the other side of Eastport in Western Passage, which is, uh, as you may know, is right on the border with uh, New Brunswick. Yes, sir. Restrictions around the area around those units, uh, lots of fishermen, do they have to stay away? Or... Uh, the, uh, no, they, they don't have to stay away. They obviously can't drop anchors there. They can't do dragging there. But uh, traversing back and forth over this, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's no restriction. So basically, the Coast Guard is obviously involved in all of what we do. There's a, if you look at a map of Cook Bay, you'll see our site plotted on the Coast Guard maps. And it's basically called an exclusion zone so that uh, you can go over it, but you can't uh, drop any anchors or you can't do any uh, dragging there. And uh, as you may know, Copscook Bay is one of the premier scallop uh, resources uh, on, the, on the East Coast, really. Uh, their scallops are amazing. We worked very closely with the fishermen. And uh, we found there were areas in the bay that were, were highly prized. And we, our deal with the fishermen is we would not go there. But there were other areas of the bay that they didn't really care about that much. And so that's what we looked at. And in fact, the site that we used was a site that was identified to us by the, by the fishermen as an area that they don't care that much about. It happened to have the, uh, the best current uh, in all of Copscook Bay, so it, it worked out very well. Hey. Yeah, uh, we, when we did the project originally, we, uh, it, this goes back quite a ways. Uh, the state of Maine established what was called the Ocean Energy Task Force uh, back in uh, 2010, essentially. Uh, during the Baldacci administration, they wanted to investigate the uh, potential opportunities 
for ocean energy, and they identified tidal as one of those opportunities, so there were incentives put in place. They offered uh, uh, basically a five megawatt contract. Uh, people could bid to, uh, to build a, a tidal project that would, that would uh, reach the capacity of five megawatts, and we won that. So we have a, a long-term power purchase agreement. The price is not yet at the point that we can put our system in and make money, so obviously we can't get investors to invest in a project that doesn't uh, make money. So uh, that's part of the whole thing we're going through now with this we call version 2.0 of our design is reduce costs to the point where we, we can then in fact uh, uh, build that project and uh, get a return on investment for uh, investors. By the way, during that project, one of the uh, great stories of that project is uh, our supply chain extended to 14 of Maine's 16 counties, meaning we had suppliers or service providers or contractors in 14 of the 16 counties. Uh, we've invested at this point probably close to $40 million in the state. We've created, during the peak of, uh, of that project, we created more than uh, 100 jobs. So uh, all of that was looked at originally as part of the allure of uh, doing tidal energy. And it turned out to be true. Yes, Sarah, in the back. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> Not us, sir. <laughs> I was just wondering, well, I guess you're probably a for-profit company, but can you still get foundation grants? It seems like the population you're trying to serve, that there ought to be some pretty big foundations out there that would want to support something like this. Especially during the R&D phase. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, foundations uh, donate money to nonprofits, yeah. typically. Okay, and we originally st we started our company as a for-profit. Uh, we haven't turned a profit yet, but someday. Uh, but Tesla hasn't turned a profit either, and they were long they've been around longer than us. So. Uh, uh, so uh, foundations are very kind of narrow in their scope of what they'll uh, donate money to, and we just don't really fit that, which is a shame, because you think that they would be interested in doing that. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are uh, groups out there uh, that uh, they're, they're what they call impact investors that are looking to invest in something new that they're going to get a return on their investment, but they're going to get more than that. They're going to do some good for the, for the world. They're going, to, they're going to do something to combat climate change. They're going to help indigenous communities. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, these investors around. They're typically uh, what they call family offices, which are families that have accumulated wealth over the years, and they create up an investment arm. And so they fill that gap between uh, philanthropy, which would be the foundations, and uh, venture capitalists, or we call vulture capitalists, uh, they, they, they fill a niche. And in fact, our company has been sustained uh, primarily by two family offices that uh, they're amazing people. I mean, they put a lot of money into the company. Uh, they're still our biggest fans, even though we haven't returned uh, any of their investment yet. They still believe in our mission. Uh, so those are the kind of investors uh, that we deal with. And just to give you rough numbers, we've raised about $90 million to date. Uh, about uh, roughly 50 of that has been uh, private investment, primarily family offices. The other has been uh, government, uh, various government grants. And we've, we've gotten uh, money from the European Union, from Canada, uh, U.S. Department of Energy. We're the, we, we've gotten more money from U.S. DOE than any other uh, company in our business, almost 26 million. So uh, DOE has been good to us. Uh, and uh, we're kind of the poster child for how do, you, how do you take public money that's put in through DOE and then raise the private capital to match that. That's the, that's the secret uh, in an industry that, that, that we exist because uh, it's, we're still considered too risky for a typical investor. Yes, ma'am. Uh so, assuming that these remote places have inexpensive power, what kind of industries could they do? 
how would it create jobs? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. Let me, I'll, I'll explain the, the long-term vision for these remote communities. Uh, I mean, the sad thing is that they sit on, some of them sit on amazing resources. I can tell you this, this uh, community, uh, Kujwak, which by the way is a, a town of almost 3,000 people. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not a village, it's, it's, it's a fully functioning uh, community. Uh, they sit on an amazing resource. But they, right now, they use uh, diesel to generate electricity. They also use diesel to heat. And in fact, it's about 50-50. So they use as much diesel to heat as they do to generate electricity. But if you have affordable, renewable energy, you displace the diesel that's used for electricity, you eliminate that, but then you can convert the heat to high efficiency electric heating, and you'll completely eliminate uh, the need for diesel. What will happen is new industries that can then spring up, as an example, they can do greenhouses. If it, all it takes is, is energy. I mean, energy is, you know, that, that essential uh, part of life that you can't exist without. And if you have an abundant supply of it, you can do a lot of things. You could use renewable energy as an example to create hydrogen, and these places could be using hydrogen-powered vehicles. So they would be zero emission vehicles. By the way, right when I was in uh, Kuzwak, uh, a, a gallon of gas was about eight or nine dollars. So uh, there's a, a vision of this that if you have a big enough renewable resource, these could become zero emission communities. So they could uh, thrive through their own agriculture and, and other means. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there any pushback for oil <laughs> <clears throat> We're not big enough for them to worry about yet. Uh, it, 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 they're, they're not really uh, worried about us. Um, uh, it, there is a concern, uh, uh, as an example, uh, in Nunavik, we're working with uh, the largest Inuit company. Uh, it's a, it's a, a company that was established under the, uh, the St. James Bay uh, Settlement Act back in the, in the 70s. Uh, so they represent all the Inuits. There's another uh, cooperative that's a similar company that provides all the diesel fuel. So they stand to lose. And, uh, but uh, amazingly, they have decided that rather than fight it, they want to join it. So they've now created a new joint venture with this other Inuit company to be part of what we're doing. So for us, it's tremendous because these people have been, they know all the logistics of these communities. They know how to deliver things, they know how to do things in these communities. So it really brings a, a lot to the table. And that's why working with the communities is so essential. There are so many untapped resources that you wouldn't think about uh, that are there, their knowledge of the water and uh, uh, you know, all the logistics involved. So uh, that's, that's our plan is to bring these uh, people into it. But big oil isn't going to worry about us because they really don't care about remote communities. They're, they're looking at the, you know, the lower 48 states, as they say, in Alaska. Uh, you know, they're looking at the, at the big ticket items, and we're not uh, even approaching that yet. Yes, ma'am. I just had a couple of clarification questions about the East Forest project. Is there something to avoid there right now? There is, there is a, there is a, a part of the original project is still there, and we use it for research purposes, but there is nothing, gen, no generating equipment in the water today. We hope to uh, have that in uh, second quarter of 2020. So the version 2.0, then, you said. Yep. And when that goes in, will that be generating to the grid? That will be generating to the grid. Uh, initially in Cops Cook Bay, and then we're going to move it over to Western Passage, and that's when we hope to build out that project after that. So it'll be the mid-2020s. The big thing, of course, is being able to secure the investment. That's the toughest part. John, you had a question earlier. Yeah, for 
versus the one community? And yeah. Um, the five megawatt project that we hope to do in uh, Eastport would almost supply all the electricity for Washington County, 28,000 people. Uh, there are there are a couple of components that are uh, highly proprietary, very specialized uh, components, like the generator. It's it's called a permanent magnet generator. It's not like a normal generator you would think about. Uh, 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 so it's a very highly specialized field, and that uh, is being supplied by a supplier actually in in Norway, not not Norway, Maine, but the country Norway. Um, the turbines, we actually uh, had, our initial supplier was in Rhode Island, but we're now out for bids, and we're uh, considering uh, suppliers from Ireland, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, the rest of the system is mostly fabricated steel and other machine components, and we buy them locally. So if we do a project in Maine, it's done in Maine. We, we try to maximize the amount of content in our projects that's, that's done locally. That's, again, part of our value proposition. So what we do in Canada will be done in Canada. What we do in the U.S. will be done here. Alaska, we have a supply chain actually established in Alaska for that project. Uh, so that's, that's how we do it. Sir, on you had the video there that had two submarines looking at least deployment type pieces on it. Um, is that part of the unit that also goes down? Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, design because it 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 looks like a it looks like a TGU sitting on a pontoon boat, basically. Um, the the pontoons are ballast tanks. So it actually deploys itself. The, the way we do it is we'll, we put the anchor in first. And the nice thing about rivers, uh, typically this river anyway, it only flows one direction. You put the anchor in, you assemble the device on the shore, you pull it out with a fishing boat, hook it up to the anchor. So it's sitting on top of the water. It rides very nicely on the water. In fact, it makes a, a great maintenance platform. We've done that. And then when you want to deploy it, we, we actually have tubes that go to the, 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 the pontoons, the ballast tanks, and then we flood one side. And it, you notice at one point in the video, it was sitting like this. The one side touches down, and then we, and then we uh, uh, put water in the other tank, and it sets down, and then it's fully deployed. It takes about a half hour from beginning to end to actually deploy it or to retrieve it. Any more questions? Joni, questions? I have been here. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I thought was interesting that you didn't mention. Now this, once it's in the water and working, it doesn't take any other energy to make it work other than the flow of the water. It's just the flow of the water, yeah. So, I mean, so many things to get energy to make electricity, you have to use other yeah. No, it's uh, it's just the flow of the water, and there's there are no uh, liquids, so there's no chance of any spills of anything. Um, the bearings we use are what are called lubricated uh, water lubricated bearings. There's no grease. There's, yeah. So it's uh, environmentally pretty benign. Can you add to the original unit this design place? All of a sudden, you've got totally growth going on. Yeah, yeah, we typically, the, the plan is, for instance, the, the project in Eastport, the five megawatt project, will probably be 12 to 14 of our units. And then we have an umbilical cord from each of those that comes uh, to an underwater, we call a consolidation pod, where we basically plug into a, a, an a underwater box, and then there's a single, uh, from there a single uh, line that comes to shore. 
And the cables are actually bundled cables. It's a combination of the power cable, the transmission cable, uh, with uh, uh, the data cable. There's a lot of data and control systems involved in this. It's, it's amazing. You, you look at this. Uh, it's kind of like a car today when you open up the hood. You know, in the old days, you opened up the hood of the car and you saw the motor, right? Uh, now you open up the car and you see all the electronics, and you wonder if there's actually a motor in there somewhere. Well, this is actually a lot like that. The electronics involved with this is absolutely amazing. It's, it's an, in fact, still advancing. Uh, so uh, the, the data cables uh, are very important. Uh, as well. So we bundle them together into one cable and bring it to shore. But you can put, uh, you know, any number of units in the water. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my family is from Nova Scotia, so I'm used to going around chasing deceased tidal wars. Some of them are really, really powerful. Can you overwhelm us? Yeah, yeah. No, we, we're actually very familiar with Nova Scotia. Uh, what, what part of Nova Scotia are you from? Well, my family is from Canada, which is on, at the very tip of the Bay of Bundy. After it curves around, it's the next to last town, 14. Yeah, okay. Because in the southwest Nova Scotia, there's uh, in, uh, in uh, Digby and in that area, there's some tremendous uh, tidal currents. The Bay of Fundy is, you know, world renowned for. It's, it's tidal. They say they have the largest tidal differential in the world, and, and actually that's not true. The northern part of uh, Nunavik has a higher differential. But nobody really lives there. There's a village there, but so they, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they didn't get their PR done right. But, uh, but no, you're right. Um, there are uh, the, the tidal currents in what's called the upper minus basin, they can reach 14 knots, which is ridiculous. And uh, there are people in our industry that are targeting their, uh, their uh, systems for that. But you can imagine the, the, the stresses uh, on a system. We took a different approach. Uh, first of all, there's only a handful of sites like Minus Basin around the world. So we took a different approach, and we, we optimized our design around a much lower flow velocity, uh, which means lower cost because you don't have to have the same structural support, et cetera. So instead of uh, you know, 12 to 14 knots, we're targeting 4 to 6 knots. That opens up most of the world, honestly. There are hundreds and hundreds of sites around the world that meet that criteria. So that was a little different approach that we took. Ultimately, we will be in the Bay of Fundy, but we won't be in the upper minus basin. We'll be in places like Digby and Southwest uh, because the currents there are much uh, uh, more uh, uh, in tune with our, our design. 